Hello guys, how's it going? My name is Al. And the first season of Dragonflight Endgame content has just begun, which opens up three primary paths of gearing your main and all characters, either by slaying bosses within raids, participating in rated PvP, or by diving into Mythic Plus dungeons. Dungeon gearing has got through quite an overhaul in Dragonflight, offering competitive item level upgrades when tackling some of the more challenging content which lets dungeons stand on a more equal footing with other forms of endgame. Dragonflight Season 1 dungeons have also gone through quite a bit of changes, with each season consisting of four of the newest expansion instances, as well as four dungeons from the previous eras of World of Warcraft, with new enemies, bosses and a new seasonal affix to overcome. If you're looking to farm these dungeons for gear, it's best recommended to brush up on the most basic strategies to be better prepared before diving into the new Mythic Plus content. So in today's video, I wanted to go over everything that you need to know in order to succeed in Season 1 of Mythic Plus in Dragonflight. But right before that, most of you guys watching these videos are still not subscribed. However, the more of you are mine, the more of you do. So let's keep it going. Subscribe to the channel as well as hit the bell if you're watching these videos anyway. Especially if you're looking to get regular class and content updates for all the future Dragonflight builds. Before we go over the new seasonal dungeons, I first want to cover the new seasonal affix of Thundering. Periodically, your dungeon group will get empowered by the Thundering Affix, increasing your healing and damage done by 30%. Thundering will last for 15 seconds and will stun your party if the buff is not removed ahead of time. Some of you will get a positive charge of Thundering, while others will get a negative charge. Thundering is removed when a positive and a negative charge collide. To avoid being stunned, make sure all players with a negative charge are cleared. Less experienced groups may want to clear the Thundering early just to be safe, but once you get used to the new affix, try to hold on to this buff for as long as possible in order to maximize its combat benefits. First, let's go over the four Dragonflight dungeons available in this pool of Mythic Plus content, starting with the Algathar Academy. The first two bosses of Algathar can be done in any order. But the first boss we will cover in this video is the Overgrown Ancient. The Ancient will periodically cast Germinate, which will spawn Hungry Lashers below the player's feet. Try to keep their numbers low. His ability of Burst Forth will awaken on nearby Lashers, causing them to join in combat and apply a nasty poison on your party. The Ancient will also summon a Branch, which will try to heal the boss while bleeding party members. This ad should be prioritized and interrupted. When the branch is slain, it releases a heal in its current location. You should try your best to keep the boss out of the heal, but make sure all the players are standing in the heal to help you recover. The next boss is Veximus. Arcane orbs will periodically travel towards Veximus from the edges of the room. These orbs should be intercepted by players, usually the tank, so that the boss doesn't soak any of them. These orbs will apply a stacking debuff causing players to take more damage from the orbs, which can be cleansed by your healer. Your tank will have to face Veximus away from your party as to not hit your allies with the Arcane Expulsion Frontal. Veximus will attack the group with Arcane Fissures and Mana Bombs, with both of these abilities leaving Arcane Pools and Explosions on the ground, which should be avoided. Next we have Croth. Your tank will take serious bleeding from her Savage Peck, so make sure to keep an eye on their health. Make sure to stop casting for the deafening screech ability, and stay away when the boss turns to you with the overpowering gust. Periodically, you will be able to play ball, scoring them at either the red goal or the blue goal. Scoring 3 points into the red goal will cause fire to rain on the floor, but will also stun the boss, causing her to take 75% more damage. The blue goal causes winds of hurricane to disrupt the boss arena, but empowers players with movement speed and a large haste increase. This goal mechanic also helps you clear the debuff of Deafening Screech, so be sure to score either the blue goal or the red goal whenever Deafening Screech gains too many stacks. Finally, we have Echo of Daragosa. All of her attacks will cause players to gain overwhelming power debuff which buffs the damage of your character by 3% per stack. 
However, if you gain more than three stacks at a time, your character will erupt into an arcane rift, which will continue to fire off arcane damage throughout the room. Be sure to avoid the boss's frontal ability of Astral Breath, spread for Energy Bomb, and try to run out when she uses Power Vacuum. Next, we have the Ruby Life Pools, starting with Melodrusa. For the Melodrusa fight, you want to avoid all ice attacks by dodging hail bombs and running out the ability of Chillstorm far away from the group. When the boss health drops to 75% and 45%, she summons whelps to help her in battle. Your group's first instinct will be to attack these adds and focus on them over the boss, but try to prioritize Melodrusa instead, as Melodrusa will cast Frost Overload, which will do a ton of group-wide damage, but can be interrupted after you break your shield. Next, we have Blaze Hoof. Before fighting her, however, you'll need to clear out the Primalist forces on a second floor. Part of the enemies you will fight will be Thunderhead, a dangerous primal enemy which has a nasty frontal attack and will debuff your allies periodically. Your healer is meant to dispel these debuffs in a staggered fashion, as every one of the dispels will do a massive amount of group-wide damage. Also, watch out for Flame Gullet, which also has a nasty breath frontal and group-wide damage which ramps up over time. Afterwards, you could fight Blazehoof. All of Blazehoof's abilities will leave lava pools on the ground, but you are free to use the entire upper area of this dungeon in order to drag this boss around. Blazehoof will summon a Firestorm Elemental, which needs to be interrupted and prioritized, but be sure to back away when you slay them in order to avoid the fiery explosions. Also, watch out for the Molten Boulders, which the boss will target at one of your party members, allowing your group members to bait this ability mechanic. Finally, we have Karaka and Urkhart. Urkhart is a shaman who will try to storm slam your tank with increasing damage, which can be dispelled. Urkhart will summon wounds, which will push your party in a random direction, and will use interrupting cloudbursts against your casters. Karaka will provide air support, raining fire upon the party. Any players hit by her attacks will gain stacks of Inferno Core, which shortly explodes into flaming embers. These embers can also be affected by the winds as well, making them sometimes difficult to avoid. Next, we have the Azure Vault. When you first enter the vault, try to avoid all sightlines of the Whelplings. Otherwise, they'll call for backup to overwhelm your party, which can quickly ruin your dungeon experience early into your Mythic Plus run. The first boss is Laymor, who can summon magical roots spread around the boss arena. These roots can be cleaved with Erupting Fissure Frontal, which your tank must aim. The ability of Explosive Brand will also help clear those roots as well. The boss ability of Consuming Stomp will do increasing damage for every arcane root active, so try to clear the room as best as you can or brace for impact. Then we have Azure Blade, a blue dragon who summons illusions to aid them in combat. Be sure to focus down on any draconic illusions whenever they are active and dodge any arcane bombs. When the boss casts overwhelming energy, try to slay all illusions quickly while dodging the arcane orbs as best as you can. Also, watch out for the tank frontal ability, which will cleave onto nearby allies. The third boss of this dungeon is Greywing, and you should try to position his frost bombs ability towards the edges of the room and try to keep them together to conserve space for your party. Clear away from all party members when focused in by the icy Devastator ability to not splash the damage on allies, and hide under shields when the boss casts Absolute Zero. Finally, we have Umbral Skull, which will punish your party causing miasma to build up whenever you move, so be very careful when it comes to positioning throughout this encounter. When Umbro Skull drops to 75, 50, and 25% of his health, his brittle scales erupt into detonating crystals, which will apply big group-wide damage if not dealt with immediately. Otherwise, avoid arcane orbs throughout the room, his crystalline roar frontal, and brace for impact when he uses Unleashed Destruction Knockback. Next is the no Good Offensive. This dungeon allows the use of dragon riding to get around the large open spaces, and the first three bosses can technically be done in any order. First, let's cover Granite, which is a simple boss. 
where your healer will need to manage the periodic group damage of shards of stone and back away when he starts using his tectonic stomp ability or risk a knockback. When the boss casts eruption, it needs to be interrupted with a nearby lance, which players have to interact with in order to stop the boss from attacking. But the no good submaterials will try to dismantle them, so be sure to stop them in their tracks. The next boss is the Raging Tempest. The main mechanic you want to watch out is for lightning orbs. The entire fight you're playing Pac-Man, soak in these orbs before they reach the boss, with every orb granting you surge of power, increasing your damage and healing for 15 seconds. Spread away when targeted by lightning strikes, which can also be used to help clear your all nearby lightning orbs in the area. And try to save your defenses for the electrical storm ability in order to help out your healer. Next we have Tira and Maruk which need to be kept together at all times, otherwise they grow stronger apart. Tira will leap around and fire a gale of arrows creating tornadoes. Make sure to spread out to make dodging them a little bit easier. And be sure to interrupt her when she casts her Guardian Wind ability. Maruk will primarily focus on the tank with his relentless onslaught and will constantly attempt to fear all of your nearby allies. And try to avoid his Earth Splitter attack at all costs. Finally, we have Balakar, who has two phases. In phase 1, he will target one player with a spear, then charge towards them through the spear's location. Try to aim the spear towards a wall away from other players. Be sure to move if he casts upheaval, and watch your tank when they take increased physical damage. When the boss reaches 60% health, he'll transition into an intermission, where nearby stormcasters enter combat. These should be interrupted and grouped together in order to be cleaved down. After the adds are dealt with, the fight moves on into phase 2, where all of the boss attacks are empowered. Static Spear will pull all nearby allies to its location, but should be handled roughly the same. Crackled Upheaval should also be avoided, and Tank will need to be dispelled from the healer when slammed by the Conductive Strikes. Next, I want to go over the dungeons outside of the Dragonflight expansion, starting with the Legion Court of Stars. In Court, certain classes and professions can gain your party bonuses, benefits, and even mechanic skips depending on your composition, so be sure to keep an eye out for all items to interact with. Before the first boss, Gerdo, try to disable all of the beacons, otherwise guards will join him in combat during the encounter. Gerdo is a simple boss. Try to dodge all of his frontals and arcane blasts, and start jumping while affected by the arcane lockdown ability, or ask for a dispel from the friendly healer. When Gerdo drops low in health, he will try to drink the Flask of Salmonite, increasing his haste and damage by 30%. However, if you have a rogue in your party, or an alchemist, you can poison the flask ahead of fight, which will cause the fight to end once he drinks it. Before fighting the second boss of Flame Wraith, you will need to deal with her lieutenants first, which can be summoned by either slain enforcers or interacting with certain elements found in the dungeon outdoor area. Flame Wraith will empower herself with burning intensity, making sure that the fight will be more painful the longer it goes on. She will also cast Withering Souls, which needs to be interrupted regularly. You should move for Infernal Eruptions or suffer fire damage and these eruptions will summon infernal imps to aid her. Try to stack all these eruptions together and then move out before they explode in order to keep these imps under control. Next we have Melandris, but before you can access his boss arena, you'll first need to find this spy hiding amongst the crowd of nightborn nobles. Certain partygoers will tell you clues about your target's appearance with 5 clues in total. Classes like Paladins and Demon Hunters can make finding these demons much easier. When you found your spy, you will need to slay it, grab the keys, and then open the door to the boss arena. Otherwise, Melandris is pretty simple. Try to bait his blade surge into corners, away from the group. This usually targets your ranged party members or healers and spawns a copy of Melandris. Avoid enveloping winds and piercing gales ground strikes and save your defensive cooldowns for slicing Maelstrom, which does bonus damage to targets in close proximity, where boss's images all mimic all of his attacks. 
Next, we have Halls of Valor, starting with the first boss of Himdal. This one is pretty simple. Avoid the dragons, which will cover a portion of the boss arena with lightning, but you'll see those dragons ahead of time hovering in the air right before the strike. Otherwise, avoid the spinning sword on the ground and watch out for tank to make sure they don't bleed out. The next boss, Herja, will either call upon the storm or the light, depending on which side of the arena she's currently standing on. The more time she spends on either side, the more powerful those powers become. During the lightning side, jump onto the shield and use your defensives to help your healers survive the encounter. In the holy phase, avoid getting hit by any of her swirlies, which are very unforgiving. And your tank can use her frontal knockback ability to quickly shift to either side. Next, we have Fenrir, which will cleave all targets near him periodically, with his damage being split amongst the party members, so make sure to huddle close. Unnerving Howl will interrupt all casting, and will summon wolves to fight in combat after the boss drops to below half health. When the boss uses Ravenous Leap, spread out in order to limit the amount of bleeds put amongst the party. And when the boss fixates on you with Scent of Blood, be sure to start running. When fighting Skovald, be sure to wield the Ages of Agrimar, usually handled by the tank at all times. When Skovald casts Ragnarok, use the shield to protect your allies. Afterwards, Skovald will use the shield for himself to summon Flames of Woe, which needs to be focused down quickly. And lightly spread to avoid cleaving into one another with the Fellblaze Rush ability. And finally, we have Odin, who needs to be brought down to 80% health in order to defeat this encounter. Odin will summon Spears of Light, which will expel glowing fragments, which should be avoided. Periodically, he will shatter all spears, which spawns forth even more fragments for you to dodge. Odin will summon a Stoneforge Obliterator, which should be interrupted and focused down. But roughly the same time he summons them, he will also use the Radiant Tempest, which will wipe out anyone caught in its radial location. When Odin marks the party with Runic Brand, try to find the runes associated with your marker. There are five runes which can be found on the floor in the boss arena. Matching the correct runes empowers your character, increasing your damage and healing done by 50%. Then we have the Shadowman Burial Grounds of Warlords of Draenor, starting with the Sadana Blood Fury. Try to position Sadana away from any daggers to mitigate your party's group by damage. And you can either focus down any spirits she summons quickly before they reach the boss and heal her, or crowd control them to keep them away from the boss's location. Her ability of Dark Eclipse will engulf your party in darkness, causing an immediate wipe unless you stand in the lunar rays on the ground, which reduces damage taken momentarily. The next boss is Nalish, whose main mechanic is Soul Seal, where he'll send you into the void where you're tasked to defeat your soul and then click on a light shimmer in order to get put back into combat. Besides that, avoid everything that is void, like his planar shift ability which will draw you closer in, or the voided projectiles from void devastation and your tank should be careful of his Void Blast Frontal in order to not aim it at nearby allies. Next, we have the Carrion Worm of Bone Maw, which will use his Body Slam ability to knock you off the platform. The boss will also cast Inhale, which will draw players closer so you can chew them up and spit them out, causing them to have to swim back to the platform. But the boss also uses Corpse Breath ability, which leaves Corpse Breath puddles on the ground. You should stand in corpse breath puddles whenever the boss uses inhale to stop yourself from moving. Throughout the fight, the boss will also summon two carry-on worms, which should be prioritized by DPS players. Just having a player next to the worms prevents them from doing group-wide abilities. These worms can technically be avoided or focused down depending on your difficulty with the boss. And finally, we have Nerzul. First things first, avoid his malevolence frontal ability and try to position the boss away from any omens of death to help reduce your party's damage taken. Focus one enemy down to create a break before being covered in the miasma of ritual bones. And finally, we have the Jade Temple from Mists of Pandaria, starting with the boss of Wise Mari. When fighting Mari, try to avoid standing on water and try to run out the Corrupted Vortex away from the center of the boss arena. When he casts the Wash Away ability, dodge the beam at all costs. 
If you're careful enough, the center of the arena should be clear for movement. Next we have the Law Walker Encounter Trial of Yongol. For this boss you'll be fighting two targets, though you should only prioritize one at a time. As you focus one of the monstrous bosses, they build up in intensity, causing them to become more aggressive. In intense stacks they become immune to all damage for a limited amount of time. It is recommended to focus on one boss until about 7 to 8 stacks, then hard swap to the other target, causing the initial boss to lose all other stacks, which helps finish the encounter faster. And watch out for players afflicted by the superiority debuff, which will cause them to grow stronger, but they will also take more periodic damage over time. Next, we have Flameheart. Try to back away when she casts her Serpent Kick ability, and be sure to dispel any allies affected by Serpent Strike. When Flameheart reaches 70% health, she transforms, and she'll cast Jade Serpent Dance, which empowers all of her attacks with Jade Fire. The tank can no longer be dispelled with Jade Fire and will require some assistance when it comes to surviving. All of her attacks and fire abilities will also be more effective, leaving green puddles on the ground. At 30%, Yulon will be released to defend Flameheart, primarily focusing on Fire Breath frontals which can be dodged and Jade Fire ground attacks which should be avoided with movement. All of the Jade Fire attacks will leave a burning puddle on the ground, so try to manage your space as best as possible, with the current common strategy of trying to keep the boss in the center of the room. Finally, we have the Shah of Doubt. The Shah will infect two targets with Touch of Nothingness, which will cause nearby allies to take shadow damage over time. Try to isolate yourself with this debuff active and call for dispels. Periodically, this shot will cause players to face their own doubts, spawning ads in the image of your party. These ads will fixate on the related player, stack them together to cleave them down and take care of them much quicker. And this should be everything you need to know about every single dungeon for Season 1 in order to help you get you started. I want to thank you all so much for watching this video and I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think about this new format of Mythic Plus for Season 1, where half the dungeons are of Dragonflight and half the dungeons are of a whole another expansion? And so far, out of the 8 dungeons available, which one is currently your favorite? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. As per usual, if you guys enjoyed this video or found it informative, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, I would very much appreciate it. And as always, in the description of every single live stream and video, we have a link to our Discord community channel. Probably the best place to reach out to me directly in case you want to let me know what you thought about this video or discuss with the other members of the community what you think about the upcoming changes. Join our Discord to become part of the community. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. I do hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts and as always, I'll see all of you guys in another video.